When she was younger she could be alone for weeks and never realize that it was time to miss another person, time to call another person on the phone. Now she found herself missing anybody she could think of. Nobody had warned her that watching her husband hold her baby with such care, their faces wordlessly open to each other in admiration, would make her feel so alone. Day after day she climbed the staircase up to the bed and lay on her side, her gut and womb positioned directly above the space where the two of them usually took their alone time together. They might be in love with each other, but her body was the causal link. Mentally she was older than ever, as tired in the morning as if it were the end of the day, but this longing for others was a smooth pink patch where she felt as raw as a child. Her name was Karen and she was 32 years old, but she had a much younger face. She had hair to her shoulders and a body like a girl's, with knobby joints. When she pushed her baby through the park in a bulky red stroller, people watched her with curiosity and pity. In her plain but adult-like clothes she looked like a teenage nanny, someone from another country who was underpaid and exploited. She was always being mistaken for a foreigner. For the next two weeks her husband would be in China, supervising the construction of a government library that was being built over the local river. Once the building was completed, the most beautiful and formally accessible part of the river would be hidden from the view of ordinary citizens. She felt lonelier without him around, but while he was away she could have her own alone time with her daughter. In the hot span of sunlight on the sofa, she drew the soft baby toward her. She rested the baby's small, heavy body on her lap and held her head in the cup of one hand. She examined the baby's face, an abbreviation of her own. But where the eye area and the mouth area met was a strange new nose, unlike any she had seen in her own family or her husband's. They had named the baby Lila, a name that was impossible for an infant to inhabit, hoping that she would grow into it. Dressed in lavender stripes, the baby looked up at her calmly and shut her mouth. By six months, infants were supposed to babble freely, but hers had said almost nothing. A traumatic or hostile home environment could obstruct an infant's development, but Karen was confident that she and her husband weren't guilty of that. They got along well, and when they fought it was in the style that he preferred, sentences clipped, reasonable but with a harsh and colorless tone. There was nothing there that could harm a baby, Karen told herself, especially one that didn't even understand words. Karen and her husband had met when they were young and working in a bigger city. One of the best things about him was his face, which was handsome but not overly so. It was a healthy, normal face, and when you looked at it you could imagine the person it belonged to doing any number of harmless things pedaling a stationary bicycle, assembling a sandwich, listening to music while driving a car. Just looking at his face was enough to make Karen feel that she had peered into every crevice of his personality. But when he was away for too long she found it difficult to remember how the different parts of his face fit together, even though they had been married for almost five years. Outside the window, men walked past berating faceless, bodiless entities on their phones. Cars rolled by so slowly that she could hear the engine whine in the deep center of the machine. It was time to begin speaking to the baby, the parenting books warned. At all moments of the day she should be linking objects with the words that identified them. Without a steady stream of well-articulated adult speech, an infant might lag in its development. Her daughter would essentially remain an animal. Karen wanted to begin speaking a steady stream of well-articulated language to her baby, but it was difficult to articulate. 
Sometimes when she sat still and listened to the inside of her mind she became distracted by the sound of a gentle rushing, like water from a faucet. From the neighboring apartment came a noisy coughing. The coffer was an unlikable retiree whom the neighbors referred to by his last name, Pauldron. Each day she watched through the sight hole in her door as he shuffled over to her stack of mail on the entryway table to pour piece by piece through her bills and catalogues, his blunt fingers pinching and creasing the flimsy photos of stylish outdoor furniture. Sometimes she heard the sound of a page being ripped out and folded into a tight packet, and when she cross-referenced her mutilated catalogue with the one online she saw that hers was now missing an image of a picnic basket or an industrial-style upholstered coffee table with wheels. Was Pauldron trying to keep her from buying those objects and putting them in her home to make her family complete? The coughing continued, louder and more urgent. It grew and solidified simultaneously, like a skyscraper seen from an approaching car. Again and again, Pauldron emptied his throat of sound and Karen could hear the wet clutch of his throat tube. A muscular, GK, shuddered at the edge of the sound, the snag of choking. He hacked at the thing trapped in him until she found herself standing up. She looked down at the small ears of her daughter, unavoidably open to the world eagerly capturing the sounds of the choking man and turning them inward to shape her soft, growing mind. The coughing turned to a wheeze, culminated in silence. Karen went over to the wall and pressed her ear to it. Nothing stirred behind the white wall, no spasm of mouth or throat. It had only been a minute or two, or maybe a couple more, since the choking started. She bumped her elbow weakly against the wall, arms full of daughter. Are you choking? She shouted. If it was true that the smallest unit of stimuli could have a formative effect, then listening to the death of her neighbor was bound to do horrible things to Lila. There could be pyromania, cutting, morbid fascination with death teenage perils that Karen could hardly believe she had experienced, in her own past. Thinking about this was like hearing a funny story about something you had done while drunk. The worst part was that she had already let it happen. Lila had heard the whole grisly soundtrack. Karen needed to show her something beautiful immediately, a swan, a fountain. She propped the baby on the sofa and went around the apartment grabbing things and throwing them into an oversized, floppy bag. She hung the bag on the stroller, buckled the little body into the seat. At the door she realized that she should have called an ambulance, so she took the phone from her pocket. It was too late, wasn't it? Karen pulled the door open to escape and found Pauldron, alive, standing by the mail table. Her reaction was relief, then irritation. The damage to Lilla's psyche had already been done. Pauldron exhaled wetly and continued his work as she pushed by him. He didn't move, there was plenty of room for the frantic woman to get by with her ugly stroller. He flipped the page, flipped the page again, until he found something workable. With small, fine movements he tugged at the paper, tearing the picture out along the crease. It was a complicated vase, asymmetrical and made of iron, an object with gravity. While there was nothing exactly wrong with the park, there was not much right with it, either. The light-colored grass was brittle to the touch but between its tufts the earth was soft and muddy. Loose bands of teenage boys and girls poured one another, the girls letting out terrifying screams and then laughing at Karen when she turned to look at them. That lady's never seen someone have fun in her entire life, one girl said. She's, like, I'm scared, another girl shouted. As Karen shoved the ugly red stroller over the chalky path, 
She wondered what type of body language she was projecting. When she left the hospital with Lila it seemed as though she had stepped onto a different planet. People looked at her now only to get out of her way. If someone stopped to speak to her, linger on her, it was always a woman, a woman with advice on how to mother, a woman who wanted to know the baby's name or age. She had emerged into a world made only of women, and although they used a friendly tone, they spoke to her as if to a new employee whose incompetence was guaranteed. Karen was surprised to see herself push past the fountain she had intended to show Lila. But what would they do with the fountain, anyhow? Crouch alongside it, peer over its grey lip into the fake blue water at a smattering of pennies, twigs, the drifting body casings of insects. Lift the baby up and dangle her over the surface so that she could swipe at the dirty water with her hand. In a larger sense, all of this would be forgotten by the child almost as it was happening. Even now, as something inside her mother unspooled, Lila seemed unchanged. Her blue eyes reached eagerly for the green grass, the rough stones. Karen took Lila's silence as license to continue on. The walk was loosening her, erasing the ugliness of Pauldron's mouth the compacted feeling that came with being at home. Instead of the fountain, she would take her baby to see the untamed water. But there was no real water in this city, Karen thought, water you could sink your body into to feel more alive. They left the park and passed the library, the grocery, an Italian restaurant that Karen hadn't eaten at since she was in college, visiting a friend. They passed a bodega where a woman sat on a squat stool arranging attractive, bright-colored oranges so that they covered the misshapen, yellowing ones beneath. The other mothers she knew were envious of Lilla's personality. She scored very well on the tests for head-turning, object memory, and facial recognition, which indicated that she was in the process of developing a high IQ, but she rarely cried or complained which allowed the other mothers to experience her as a being of pure adorability, a sponge for affection that asked nothing in return. But the daughter that Karen wanted was one who talked, who chatted, who would help her become more of a human being and remake the world for her through her own eyes. I love you just like you are, she said out loud. In Karen's grip the stroller's handlebar was shaking, twisting left and right and left, as though there was someone holding on to the front of the stroller, pulling it. Lilla's soft white face began to crumple, and from its open center came a high wail as the contraption shook her body. Karen stopped to see what had gone wrong, and the apparatus tipped forward and drew a lazy arc in the air, moving slow and quick at the same time, making it look as if the baby were diving. By falling onto her knees and blindly thrusting her arms out, Karen was just able to keep Lila from hitting the sidewalk. Karen looked at the stroller, at the child. The inside of her head felt slow with panic, and the sound of her daughter crying muffled her thoughts. A wheel had come off, she could see it a few yards back, and who knew where the piece that held it on had been lost. The stroller would have to be left behind, she couldn't carry it and the baby both. At the same time, the stroller was so expensive that she knew she would have to come back for it. It had a chassis of feather light, heat-resistant titanium, and its parts had been manufactured in Germany by a company that made some of the less important parts of airplanes. She and her husband had agreed that it was the best model, safe and firmly made. When she wheeled it around, with its geometric pattern diaper bag and its plastic frame as shiny as a fast food playground, she felt bumbling and cartoonish. Karen gathered Lila, red with tears, in her arms and began walking. It was only a few moments later that she remembered to think of a place to go. 
In the cafe in the neighborhood where people came mostly to shop, there were only two other customers. A young man on a laptop, his large head squeezed between headphones, and an older woman eating a salad who might have been a young grandmother. Karen ordered a hot tea and sat down at the table farthest from both of them. Her arms ached, and she had blisters where heel and instep met the straps of her sandals. She felt guilty. She didn't want to go back for the stroller, but to buy a new one would confirm to her husband that she was unable to keep valuable objects in her possession. Karen, he'd said tenderly when she lost a good sweater that she'd just bought, you're a net with one big hole in it. Everything just slips through you. With her gaze fixed on an empty corner, Karen adopted the flat facial expression of someone reading, though she had nothing to look at. She slid off her shoes. She just wanted to drink the sweet, tepid tea and think of nothing. But out of the corner of her eye she saw the older woman watching her between brief, performative glances at a magazine. Karen looked over, and looked away again too late. Did you borrow that shirt from someone? The older woman asked, smiling toothily and leaning toward Karen. No, Karen said. It was her own shirt. Karen turned to Lila and pretended that she was doing something involving and important with her. Taking a corner of Lila's soft yellow blanket, she dabbed the little face gently, over and over. Well, it's very nice, the voice said from behind her back. Karen felt a tug on her sleeve and turned her head. The woman was next to her, and rubbing the fabric between her middle finger and her thumb. The shirt was too big, it was a cotton blend, covered in a garish print of lilies and strawberries. In fact, Karen hated this shirt. Thank you, she said stiffly, holding still. Has she started to say her words yet? The woman asked, indicating Lila with a point of her fork. She reached back to her table and brought forth her salad, stabbing at it with a plastic fork. It's too early, Karen admitted. Too early for babbling, even. It's a lonely time. I know it. You two are together all day long, and there's nobody even to say, mm hum, the woman laughed. Karen nodded slowly. I'm Linda. How old are you, honey? Linda asked, holding out her hand. 32, Karen answered, wiping her sweaty palm on her shorts and squeezing Linda's outstretched hand for an instant. Linda smiled and nodded, as though she wasn't surprised. In her green silk blouse and pink pattern scarf, she was either somebody who understood colors very well or someone who didn't understand them at all. And you feel a million years old inside, am I right? Linda smiled winningly, her teeth sharply white in the dim lighting. Linda reminded Karen of a TV mother, someone who always gave good advice and probably had never been bored, anxious, or confused in her life. I don't know, Karen said. Well, don't we all, Linda said, and shrugged as a long, escalating cry began to break from the baby. You live life one way for, what, 30 years, you've just finally, barely gotten used to the way life is and then bam. Linda swiped her finger against Lila's wailing mouth. Lila quieted instantly. They tell you that you gotta start learning life all over again. Bam. Isn't that right? Linda winked at Karen, and wiped the front and back of her hand on a napkin. How did you do that? Karen exclaimed, truly impressed. Oh, just an old family trick. Old, old trick, Linda said, leaning in. A teensy dab of butter on the lips. Tamps them down like lambs. Linda was different from other mothers Karen had met. When she gave advice, it wasn't stuffy. She was full of stories. 
For every frustration Karen named, Linda knew someone who had in fact gone through just that problem. Linda was a sort of freelance psychoanalyst, consultant, therapist, whatever you please. Diverse but well-respected people, she said, had sought her services for issues ranging from their child's learning disability to what type of second career they should take on. She had just got these great new business cards printed on a 100% cotton paper, the real thing, only she didn't have any with her today. As for Karen, what she was dealing with was completely natural. Linda pounded her fist on the table in a fun way, to make the point, it's easy to lose yourself in a kid, even easier if you love it. Your husband comes back, he's tired, you're tired, in the end all you have time for is a little kiss on the mouth and a conversation about what the little baby ate that day. Nobody sees you as yourself anymore, only as the walking mouthpiece for that cute bud of flesh. But, let me tell you, it gets easier. I know it. Karen tried to think of what her identity restoring ritual might be. Her feet ached, her shoes were sweaty. Seated in Karen's lap, Lila reached out a small hand for the soiled napkin on the table, grasped it vaguely, let it slip back. But you can't let yourself get down about not feeling a hundred percent of the time like the new person you're supposed to be, Linda added with a concerned tone to her voice, her bangs bobbing up and down as she spoke. It's those expectations, honey. They'll drive you insane. Karen nodded. Then she remembered the stroller. She had been sitting in the cafe for more than an hour. Linda's salad was long gone. Oh, God, Karen said. I have to go back. Go back where? Linda asked, distracted. For the stroller, part of it broke, the wheels off, I can't put the baby back in it. Someone's going to take it if I leave it there too long. Karen didn't trust the people of this city, the city in which she lived. In her last city, she smiled or waved when she saw strangers looking at her. Oh, don't worry about it. I'll watch the baby, Linda said, waving her hands in the air to show it was no big deal. Karen hesitated. Look, honey, Linda said. You haven't got a choice. Life's like that sometimes, you gotta take care of business. You're going to go do your business and come right back, and I'll be right here with the little one, reading my magazine. It's the only way. You're sure? Karen asked. Yes, 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 Linda said warmly. Just go, I'll tend to her every need. I'll just be 15 minutes, Karen said, embarrassed. Yes, 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 Linda said. Get out of here. Karen picked up her tote and looked down at Lila, still reaching for the napkin, still failing. Karen took the napkin and folded it into a small square, which she slipped into the bag. I'll be gone for a moment, she said to the infant in an upbeat, gentle voice. And then I'll be back. She thought. It means nothing, she added, tenderly. As she stepped out the door she looked back. She expected to see Linda smiling toothily, holding Lilla's little hand and waving it around in a semblance of goodbye. Instead, Linda was rooting around in her handbag for something. Linda and Lila, those names went together better than Karen and Lila. What would it signify if Lila chose to unfurl her first words in front of a kind stranger rather than her own mother? Outdoors the sun made her squint and the air smelled of cars. Her husband would have found a way to reclaim the stroller without losing sight of the baby. He had always been good with logistics, one of those people who behaved as though they had the instruction manual for the world. Since the baby was born, this quality had become exaggerated. 
Her husband seemed crisper and clearer. His jaw was better defined and when he moved around the kitchen putting coffee mugs back in their place his gestures had a mime-like precision. She was amazed to see him come into focus. But sometimes she had the feeling that she had come into focus for him, too, and what he saw puzzled him. The night they brought Lila home, Karen had folded a soft striped blanket in half and then in half again, making a bed for the baby so she could sleep between their bodies. As she placed it on the mattress and pressed into it a baby-shaped depression, her husband walked in. He lunged toward the bed and grabbed the blanket from her as if it were a burning thing. What do you think you're doing? He said, his voice rough. Babies die that way, he said, and hurled the blanket at the wall. After they had turned out the lights, he rolled over and covered her in a slew of silent kisses before falling asleep. As Karen walked back toward the corner where she had abandoned the stroller, she realized that, for all Linda's talk about mothering and its pressures, she had never said explicitly that she had children of her own. For all Karen knew, Linda was as bad at it as she was. The stroller was intact, its wheel still lying in a patch of marigolds several yards back. Nothing was missing except a few energy bars and a handkerchief from the side pouch, which showed that somebody willing to steal had decided that the bulky vehicle was not worth the trouble. The blisters on Karen's feet had spread to the thick skin of the sole, and she knew she wouldn't make it back to the cafe unless she wrapped her feet up. Even so, she felt oddly good as she dragged the stroller behind her, a stranger watching from across the street might have described her as full of purpose. She felt that Linda had said something that she herself had wished to say for some time. She had to find herself, inside herself, if she was ever going to feel connected again to the things she did all day. She thought about a friend she once had, and the long emails they had written to each other during their freshman year describing at weekly intervals precisely how they felt college was changing them, as though meticulously logging this data could keep it all within their control. I'm leaving you this trail of crumbs so you can find me and return me to myself if I wander too far away. Karen couldn't remember which one of them had written that junk line. Now her friend was living in Hollywood, a recovering heroin addict who never returned anybody's calls. Karen left the stroller leaning on its empty titanium hub outside a drugstore and limped inside. At the sound of the doors sliding open, the cashier at the counter looked up, then dismissed her immediately. The cashier was carving little marks into the checkout counter with a small, pointy pair of scissors. Karen limped past light bulbs and window cleaner, rejuvenated. Even here, in these boring and overlet aisles, her new good mood made it feel as though anything could happen. She could run into a friend or an ex-lover. She could receive an important phone call. She could have an important thought that would make her whole situation apparent. She stood in front of the bandages and band-aids, taking in all their myriad shapes and colors, clear, nude, cloth-covered, breathable plastic, patterned with racing cars and cartoon dolphins. She read the backs of the boxes, all the energy and force she would next use to find herself she directed toward this first decision, a practice decision. To her right, a man watched her, his hands in his pockets. He had a nice face, with big teeth and ears. When you looked at his face, you could see right through it to the one he had as a little boy. It was easy to imagine him hanging upside down on a swing or standing in front of a rose bush, swatting at it with a broken off stick. Karen saw him staring at her. She thrust forward a package of band-aids. Are you looking for these? She demanded. Ah, no, sorry, he said. 
He paused. It's just, I think I know you. He had a look on his face as if he were waiting for her to complete a sentence. From where? Karen asked. She looked more closely at his whole person. He wore a white button-down shirt. She had always had trouble recognizing people she knew when they dressed up for work. He named the college in Connecticut that she had gone to. He had been a film major. The film program had changed since he'd gone there. He told her, it used to deal in concrete skills, the mechanics of shooting and editing a film. Now it was mostly where people went to argue about movies. Sometimes they invited him back to give a talk and he thought about refusing, but in the end he did it anyway, because if he could, in his 30-minute talk, impart any advice on how one manipulates the substance of film he felt that it was his duty. Karen nodded. She relaxed. With his patronizing tone and his floppy brown hair, he was just the sort of person she used to listen to at parties, trying to think of intelligent, psychologically driven questions to ask while taking small sips from a cup of lukewarm beer. She had always been interested in people like this. In their arrogance, they reminded her of the type of stylized, opinionated person she might have become if she had been a man. How about you? He asked abruptly, as if she had vanished suddenly and had just now reappeared. Well, Karen said, I'm still writing. That's great. What do you write? He had an interested but slightly lost expression on his face. She wrote essays. She had written profiles of well-known people, actresses and an artist who sculpted glaciers out of man-made and toxic materials. She had written a long-reported article on water sanitation. She had ghostwritten a book by a comedian whose awkward jokes about foreigners were obsolete. All that was left to him was to cash in on the stories he had of performing with people whose more robust fame persisted to this day. As Karen spoke, she saw that her old classmate was impressed by the things she had accomplished. She felt content. Talking about work had always made her feel more like herself. He asked thoughtful questions and she answered them, taking up almost all the space in the conversation. Something in her was eager to expand, to monopolize, to be casually selfish, in the way that others often were with her. She felt free, in an old, almost forgotten way. The happiest week of her life had been in college, the summer after junior year. She had stayed in town working at the library, where she catalogued old, miscellaneous photos according to the objects or themes they contained, fanaticism, rhinoceros, etiquette. At the end of August, other students who had spent the summer in town went home to visit their families for a week or two, but Karen's parents were at a convention. So she worked unsupervised in the frosty archive and after work she jogged five miles to an old railway bridge over the river, where she dangled her feet and looked down, watching trash and swathes of plant debris pass below. When her mother called, she turned her phone face down and left it there. She would call back several hours later, once she was sure her family were all asleep. She talked and he nodded. Talking was easy, as it used to be when she was younger and as it would be again in the future. This town, which was still foreign to her, would become home and home would slip into foreignness. It was only in this small sliver of her life that she would be lonely, and it would pass. But then Karen noticed that the man was looking at her more intently than before. She turned away, a reflex. Listen, he said seriously. I'm glad you're not still upset, but I wanted to apologize. Apologize for what? Karen asked. You know, for what happened that last year of school. He picked a box of toothpaste up from the shelf, glanced at it, and put it back down. 
Karen searched her college memories for times when she had been wronged. Most of her life, she felt, had been spent alone in rooms. I don't know, she said. For the video, I hear it messed you up. Karen could tell he was annoyed that she was making him reassemble the whole situation in words. The video of you, he said. The one I used for class. I know it seemed exploitative, but the idea was to implicate myself. About being male in the cultural moment of the sex tape. No, Karen said. I don't think anything like that's happened to me. He looked at her in disbelief. I don't think I'm who you're thinking of, Karen said slowly. When exactly were you there? It became clear that he had graduated several years after her, they hadn't even overlapped. She had a young face for her age, or he had an old one. They stood in the toothpaste band aid aisle feeling uncomfortable. To Karen he was worse than a stranger, she knew with certainty that something weird lurked inside him. He sensed her change in attitude and stuck his hands back in his pockets. What did you mean, the cultural moment of the sex tape? Karen asked. He didn't seem to hear her. Already he seemed a mile away. He was closing up as she watched. What did you do? Karen asked. She stared at him. I don't remember, he said, unconvincingly. It was forever ago. Karen suddenly realized that she hadn't thought of her husband in more than an hour. Had he thought of her, even once? The sun was setting behind the cross hatching of oak trees as Karen dragged the empty, tilting stroller toward the cafe as quickly as she could. The sight of the intent, ferocious looking woman with the empty stroller alarmed the people she passed, but Karen didn't notice. She was truly ready to go home. It seemed incredible to her that just a few hours earlier she had thought that staying in that apartment for another second could kill her. Now she knew that she would become irreparably warped if she spent another minute out here. She felt as if she were deep underwater, desperately stroking up toward the surface, toward light and air. She had no idea how far away it might be. She'd get back to the cafe, thank Linda for her time, and hurry her baby home. Home was still a safe space. Everything had gone well there, in the end. Pauldron was alive, he hadn't choked, not completely. And, even if he had, the choking was just another corporeal encounter, the body articulating itself around the obstacle of that which choked it. It didn't mean anything more than that. The word express derived from the medieval Latin expressair, meaning to press out or obtain by squeezing. The word had once been used as a term for extortion. It was possible that to cough, to choke, was the root of all speech, the urgent need to evacuate something whose internality threatened to kill you to express yourself or be expressed by extruding words. It was just a bodily function, like sweating or throwing up. Sometimes you felt relief afterward, but there was no point in doing it unless you had to. Lila would speak on her own schedule, when the small, mild experiences she was accumulating finally coalesced into something she needed to expel. The past was just a place where uncontrolled freaks you had never consciously decided to include in your life entered it anyway and staggered around, breaking things. Compared with the gentle, competent family she had chosen, they were monsters. Even someone like Linda, seemingly so warm and lively, was an unknown. Though Karen had felt happy and connected after talking to her, when she reflected on their conversation she realized that they had spoken mostly about Linda herself, mostly in glowing terms, without Karen's learning anything concrete that would make her real. 
Since graduating from college, since getting engaged and then married, since moving to this new, worse city, Karen had mourned her growing isolation. She had longed for the unpredictable, haphazard quality that other people had, which she had found beautiful. But what seemed more beautiful to her now was the new being, unsullied, perfect in every way, whose entire existence so far had unfolded under her gaze. As she rounded the corner to the block where she would find the cafe, Karen saw that something had gone on. In the vivid blue dusk, flashes of a brighter blue alternated with hot red, electrifying the trunks of trees and the sides of buildings. A few people milled around talking, while others walked past as though everything were just as it should be. With a terrified expression on her face, Karen ran with the ugly stroller, her feet festooned with band-aids, toward police cars up ahead. As she came close she saw, first, a policewoman with a short blonde ponytail, then her partner, who had a notepad, and then a pot-bellied man explaining something to him with vigorous gestures. She saw the vehicles double parked by the entrance to the cafe, where the lights were on and the barista slid a rag along the counter. There was no sign of Linda, or of her garish pinks and greens. Linda was gone. The light was ending. And then in the arms of a policeman standing in the yellow sheet of light cast by a street lamp that had just come on, she saw Lila, she saw her baby. She squirmed gently, held by a stranger. Linda had left her there, gone about her own business. With a shudder, Karen thought of the stranger's hands, the strange hot arms. Inside the baby, something was taking shape. There were colors and planes, indistinct, as if viewed through a thick layer of water. There was dimness and cold, the unmoored perception of bright blue and red, flashing. The baby watched as her mother came toward her with a face full of terror. The two eyes large and wild, the mouth pouring. With her gentle mind, the baby took in the face and waited, waited as it sank slowly to the top of a pile of things without names, waited for the noisy world to become still once more. It was all collecting inside there, gathering like dust, building, building up, until someday there would be enough for some part to pierce the surface of her silence and gasp out a piece.